Hey, I'm Hollis, and welcome to the Friendly Fangirl Podcast, where I nerd out on the films, shows, and video games that I encounter every week. Be sure to follow this podcast, and please follow my Twitter and blog at Hollis Films to follow my journey experiencing the entertainment industry's greatest stories. Beware of spoilers, you have been warned. Game of the Week is Mortuary Assistant, which seems to be one of the leading horror games this year. Becoming a new face of high-quality indie horror. First of all, there is plenty of gameplay involved as there are five endings. Trying to find out how to successfully hit all endings is half the fun. However, the... (laughs) The embalming bodies part has its ups and downs. <laughs> For starters, it's extremely it's an extremely uncomfortable process, <laughs> so definitely sets the mood. <laughs> Although it does become repetitive after a while as you play through multiple nights to reach the different endings. That repetitiveness is honestly the biggest downside that the game has, because the rest of it's pretty the re- all the other aspects are pretty fun. Although you do become a bit desensitized to the scares the more you play, especially after seeing some of the same hallucinogenic sequences. However, the scares themselves are very well done and might get you the f- really badly the first time around. Even the cheap jump scares that you probably get multiple times will still probably always get you There are jump scares, but most are actually pretty effective. I think the best scares are the shadow people and the figures hiding in corners quietly, as well as any disturbing scares involving the bodies themselves. The scare factor is real and makes for a horrifying experience when playing in the dark. To finish off, I find the concept and story very interesting as well. The whole idea of the demon marker puzzle is interesting, the plot involving the basement is interesting also, and there's just lots lots of supernatural vibes going around and it's great. I watched the first season of American Horror Stories and I thought it was okay. I liked it enough to catch season 2 and here we are. With American Horror Story New York City starting, let's dive into what stories gave us earlier this year. The very first episode was so promising. (laughs) Dolls had a pretty cool connection to Coven in a cool way as it gave some backstory to Spalding, uh, played by the legendary Dennis O'Hare. I preferred this tie-in versus the Murder House tie-in from last season as it's, it's honestly hard to like anything about the Murder House unless you have the right actors, which last season just couldn't pull off for one reason or another, but the Dolls episode did its crossover job and it did it right. Aura. This was another solid episode as it was a touch of it was a touch of modern ghost story vibes. It was nice to see Gabri Sidibi Sidib. I never know how to say her name. Gabori Sidib, I think. Um, It was nice to see her again, and I thought the story and acting was all enjoyable. Drive. Sheesh. Okay. Honestly, it had potential. I am a person who feels like Bella Thorne is just overrated. (laughs) I, I can't help. I can't help it, but compare her to Zendaya, who also got her start on Disney's Shake It Up. Zendaya is as successful as she is because she's genuinely, genuinely talented. Bella, mm, she lacks in that area. She's, she's just another pretty face with basic acting skills, and that's the main issue I had with the episode itself. If it were someone else, like Billy Lord, for example... The episode would have been so much better as the acting would have helped improved on what was already a shaky storyline to begin with. Milkmaid? I don't really want to talk about this one. I mean, it, it was extra disgusting 
and hard to watch. But there were still some strong elements to the story, and Cody Fern is always a pleasure to watch, of course. Bloody Mary. I think this was my favorite episode of the season. First of all, the main, the main actresses were all great. I also felt attached to the main characters as well. The story is exactly what I thought an American Horror Story take on Bloody Mary would be. The design of Bloody Mary herself was also super cool, and Dominique Jackson just did such a good job portraying her. Facelift. My mom was there to let me know that this was a spoof on an episode of The Twilight Zone, except reversed. Of course, the wrapped up face of Virginia's was very creepy, but not as much as her actual transformation. It was gross and disturbing. And honestly, death was a good ending. You know, classic cult story. They, yeah, it was weird. <laughs> Necro was something else. <laughs> I honestly don't know what to say. It's definitely a very different experience than the game of the week, Mortuary Assistance. That's for sure. <laughs> like, honestly expected this to be like that one episode from Kim Possible with that one boy that turned into a swamp monster, but it was actually like the Scooby-Doo tale of a cursed town with like zombies. It was okay, I guess. It was mediocre overall. Like, it wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was just, it was just there. Um, but a bit disappointing as the last episode of the season. It is what it is. The thing with horror stories is that every story is a hit or miss. It was like that with season one as well, and it was the same for season two. I'd recommend this little spinoff, but you're honestly not missing out on much if you don't watch it. However, I will say... I think overall I enjoyed season two a little bit more, whereas season one had some stronger individual episodes. I just think the quality of season two overall was a bit better, but still, it's like, the show itself is a six out of ten, so. 2022 saw the fourth season of Stranger Things, and if you were unaware, many, many, many fans continuously compared Vecna to Freddy Krueger, and I mean, the show even went as far as to have Robert England himself be a guest and not- actually, I was gonna spoil it, but let me not. <laughs> but since Nightmare on Elm Street kind of had a, uh, I guess, secret appearance to in Stranger Things, which was the pop culture event of 2022 so far. Um, just gonna dive into my thoughts about the original movie. So one of the very first horror movies that I ever watched as a kid was Freddy vs. Jason. Years later, I've watched both of their original movies and have loved both. Um, but of course, the spotlight is Freddy Krueger. The biggest thing that makes Freddy stand out is well, everything. <laughs> sure, we've got Jason and Michael going around in masks, killing people in brutal ways, but Freddy doesn't wear a mask. That's just his face. His ability to kill people through their dreams is also extremely unique, and even after 40 years later, there's also something about his voice and his knife gloves that pull the fear factor of the character together. Robert England just knew what he was doing. There's no denying that Freddy Krueger is a Halloween icon to be reckoned with. The Nightmare on Elm Street as its own movie is actually pretty good. It, it's a pretty good standalone horror story. The concept itself is truly terrifying if you really think about it. The backstory is interesting. The deaths are insane and super bloody. <laughs> Rip Johnny Depp. And Heather Langenkamp did a great job as Nancy for the main protagonist of the story. 
I also feel like the graphics, um, the graphics for its time were not that bad. Like, it still kind of holds up a little bit and it works. Overall, this is a classic horror slasher film. I saw a couple of the sequels that weren't too bad either. Elm Street is a must, a must scary experience and it's an essential to any spooky occasion, especially during this spooky season, and I highly recommend it. So I watched Requiem of a Dream about a month ago for the first time ever, and when I wasn't crying or being depressed, I was wondering who the heck was playing this tragic old lady and why is he, why is she so good? Thus, the Superstar Award goes to Ellen Bernstein, and if you don't know who she is either, well, let's get to know a bit about her together. Ellen Burstyn was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. She was the president of her high school drama club until she dropped out of her senior year. After spending a couple years as a professional dancer, dancer and model, Ellen made her Broadway debut in the Broadway play Fair Game. Most of the 60s saw Ellen as a guest star on many different television shows like Perry Mason, Gunsmoke, and The Defenders. She also had a recurring she also had recurring roles in shows like The Doctors and Iron Horse. The 70s was Definitely when Ellen saw the peak of her career as she became a breakout star in the best way. It all started with her role in the coming of age story, The Last Picture Show. The film did big at the Academy Awards, which included Ellen's first of several Oscar nominations. Now, when I looked up Ellen Burstyn, I discovered what I already knew her for. And that was for the role as the mother, Chris McNeil, in one of the most iconic horror films of all time, The Exorcist. <laughs> yeah. See, there's a reason why Ellen is a superstar in a podcast that's mostly been revolved around the spooky season. The Exorcist was a hit in theaters and allowed Ellen to snag yet another Oscar nom while also giving her the opportunity to become a face in the horror movie industry. Third time's the charm as Ellen's met next major role in Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore earned her her first and only Oscar win. Ellen starred in the film's Providence and A Dream of Passion before starring in same time next year, not only did Ellen earn yet another Oscar nomination, but also won her one and only Golden Globe Award for Best Actress, and Ellen originally portrayed this role when it debuted as a play on Broadway and won her only Tony Award. What a way to end an incredible decade, and what a phenomenal career achieved in less than 10 years. And to kickstart the 80s, surprise, surprise, Ellen receives another Oscar nomination for her first role in the decade, Resurrection. Around this time, she portrayed Jean Harris in the trial reenactment film The People vs. Jean Harris, with the role giving Ellen her first of several Emmy nominations. Ellen returned to Broadway twice in the 80s in the plays A4, Charing Cross Road, and Shirley Valentine. Ellen also starred in several TV movies, including the Emmy-nominated Pack of Lies. Through the 90s, Ellen did two more plays on Broadway, Shimada and Sacrilege. She also appeared in the films When a Man Loves a Woman, How to Make an American Quilt with Winona Ryder, and playing by the heart with Sean Connery. The 80s and 90s were fairly chill for Ellen, but given how the 70s went, I'd want it to be chill too. However, 
the 2000s saw things pick up for Alan once again. Alan's 21st century began with what is probably Alan's greatest role of all time. Alan Burstyn played the drug-addicted elderly woman Sarah Goldfarb and Darren Ar Aronofsky's Requiem of a Dream with Jared Leto and Jennifer Connelly. Ellen's performance was powerfully heartbreaking. She was nominated for an Oscar for her performance, and this was an Oscar she deserved more than anything. <sighs> Requiem for a Dream is a film you have to see at least once in your life. Through the rest of the decade, Ellen took on projects like The Wicker Man with Nicolas Cage, uh, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood with Sandra Bullock, The Fountain with Hugh Jackman and Rachel Weisz, and According to Greta with Hilary Duff. Ellen returned to Broadway in 2003 in the play Oldest Living Confederate Widow Tells All, and in 2009, Ellen won a Primetime Emmy for her guest appearance on Law & Order SVU. This Emmy saw Ellen Burstyn become the 18th individual of an exclusive list of 24 to achieve the Triple Crown in acting, having also already won an Oscar and a Tony Award. Sharing this legendary achievement with other acting icons like Maggie Smith and Jeremy Irons and Christopher Plummer. Wrapping up through the last 10 years, Ellen has remained quite busy. Her last appearance on Broadway was in a play entitled Picnic. Ellen was part of the phenomenal cast of the miniseries Political Animals, winning another Emmy for her performance. She also appeared in Christopher Nolan's Interstellar in 2014, and in that weird Lifetime movie, Flowers in the Attic, as the crazy grandma that same year. Since then, she's also appeared in other films like Age of Adeline, The Tale, and Pieces of a Woman. Her latest project this year was The First Lady as Sarah Delano Roosevelt. It's actually a pretty interesting concept, so check it out. There are still a few more projects lined up for the legendary Ellen Burstyn, according to IMDb, and it's only right to end this segment for the spooky season by mentioning an Exorcist sequel. For better or for worse, Ellen will be reprising her role as Chris McNeil, and even if the film is poor, it's at least an excuse to watch the original that Ellen was in all those years ago when her phenomenal career was just starting. That's it for this week. Again, follow me on Twitter or leave a comment and let me know what you've been fangirling over this week. Thank you for joining me and I'll talk to you again next week.